a natural dissatisfaction with complacency, uh, which makes sense, right? Because if we were to go back 50,000 years when we were anatomically identical, the people that would survive would be the people that aren't satisfied, that want to keep moving, that want to keep exploring more and going and exploring new boundaries. Um, but obviously, as you can imagine, in the modern world, especially in the technological world, uh, that can be a detriment. You're listening to The Real You, thoughts, ideas, and perspectives from the ordinary and all of us. My name is Dooley, and this podcast is in partnership with Pocket Change, the social platform built to show the real you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, wait, no, you said something interesting, though, with the, the, evolution, the evolution of humans and walking and how that's yeah. a basic human thing. I've got an interesting question that I actually think about a lot. What do you think the most, okay, in evolution itself and knowing our modern age as humans, what do you see as a very positive thing? And what do you see as a very negative thing in terms of our biological evolution in our modern technology advanced life? That's a great question. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I think about this all the time because I do think that a lot of modern issues and questions can be answered by just looking back at prehistory, which is subsequently biology. Um, you know, what made humans so great in terms of evolutionary advancements and being able to become like the, pre, like the for all, all intents and purposes, like the apex species on the planet is their like, constant dissatisfaction with where they are and their ability to adapt right? Like a lot of animals in the animal kingdom are specialists. That's why pandas can only live in the Chinese mountains, right? Because they can only eat bamboo. That's why, you know, narwhals can only live in specific areas because they're specialized to be in one place. Humans are not. Humans are like as vanilla as it gets because they're able to adapt to anywhere. Um, but yeah, I think like the biggest detriment in terms of evolution in the modern world is the constant desire for more, right? The constant desire to always be exploring new things. And like, a natural dissatisfaction with complacency, uh, which makes sense, right? Because if we were to go back 50,000 years when we were anatomically identical, the people that would survive would be the people that aren't satisfied, that want to keep moving, that want to keep exploring more and going and exploring new boundaries. Um, But obviously, as you can imagine, in the modern world, especially in the technological world, uh, that can be a detriment. Yeah, I I was... You said ad- adaption is 100% my, that was the answer I had pre-question, was <laughs> was the adaptability of, essentially, there's the positive side to it, which is, even co- even with COVID, that's kind of a good example is, okay, all of a sudden shit starts to shut down, we start to live this new form of life, right, we're stuck inside, we are all of a sudden on Zoom calls, we're doing this thing, um, we quickly are able to kind of adapt and sort of normalize right of okay we can figure out how to still run society we can shift in the way that we need to get things done we can do all these things but then you flip that to the negative side is we become almost complacent in the fact that um what we've adapted to is now just the way it is and we've become like so accustomed to rapid adaption that now all of a sudden we're on zoom and consuming each other's lives and all these things through social media through um this fast-paced click quick response entertainment that it becomes we've adapted so fast that it's become the new normal and all of a sudden we've lost the human in us i I had a conversation with someone the other day actually that we're essentially biologically training ourselves to become an alien race and not like on purpose but the fact that things that were human 400, 500 years ago have, and the things that are human now were completely alien to what a, a human would actually experience and for the total progression of our evolution. And now it's happening on this exponential curve and we're just rapidly turning into the aliens that we have such mysterious wonders about. And it kind of comes down to that, that simple question of like, what is the positive and negative of our evolution and it's in my to your answer and to mine is like that adaption and how quickly we can do it and come up with new things but then how quickly we become accustomed to being in pain being in this chasing being in this judgment world living at a larger scale than we ever should have as humans or 
ever could comprehend. Um, so yeah, I'm really interested by that concept of adaption in general, because there's so many sides to that script. Yeah, no, it's, it's such an interesting question that you could let people spend their whole lives pondering. Um, there's actually, in terms of saying, like, at what point are we no longer human? Uh, there's actually a great book by Yuval Noah Harari. He's an anthropologist. He's the one who wrote Sapiens. It's actually the sequel to Sapiens. It's called Homo Deus. And it kind of spends 600 pages pondering that question of at what point in this new cultural and technological evolution do we stop being human? And he makes the case that, you know, it's happening a lot quicker than one would expect because mm -hmm. we're halfway there to already being cyborgs with the use of our cell phones, right? Like that pretty much for all intents and purposes is an extension of most of our bodies. We yeah. always have it on us and, you know, it's become very habitual. And now as we continue to get closer and closer to actually creating um, like technological adaptations in our own human body, right? Like, I mean, 10% of the population probably has a fake hip or some sort of like, like endoskeletal surgery like that for all intents and purposes is a cyborg and we're only getting closer and closer with as like obviously VR and like, you know, I feel like this is cliche, but Neuralink, right. And that we just need to make that gap between technology and like the human biology smaller and smaller. So that's a really interesting question. Um, you know, I really think, yeah, like if someone were to look at humans a hundred years ago and the way we are now, they'd be like, those people are aliens. Yeah. But, um, so the shift, yeah. the shift of that though is, say with the Neuralink thing, thing, and also even coming into the example of the cyborg surgery thought, which is we're constantly just replacing our own body parts to enable a quote longer, healthier life. Um, is that a positive thing, or is that and that positive and negative? Is even kind of a hard way to describe it, but the human and unhuman versions of that because in one sense the human side is no our bodies are capable of regenerating certain areas and doing these things like let's use that to our advantage of a longer life and then there comes the question of what if theoretically we get so advanced to the point that you can start to replace everything including heart pieces and pieces of the brain to where there's just this theoretical hundreds and hundreds of years of life just to keep you alive but it has to do with so many separate parts and like, is that still you within your soul and your identity or like, is your physical body just separate of that? Or what are your thoughts there on the theoretical yeah. hyper progress of body replacements and how that could potentially make us live for centuries beyond our current life? Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great question. And, you know, this is a very pressing topic because one of the biggest movements right now next to Web3 is the longevity movement, right? You know, some mm -hmm. of the smartest, wealthiest, most powerful people in the world are trying to crack the code of how do we defeat that, right? Like they view aging as a disease and they believe that we can, if not stop it, and maybe even reverse it. And, you know, I, I look on both sides of these things because on one side, I do think that, you know, living is close to how we're evolutionarily evolved to live is the best path to optimal health and fulfillment. But at the same time, you know, I'm really big into biohacking. I'm, I'm into ways where we can, for all intents and purposes, hack our biology to feel better, to live better, to live longer. Um, I, you know, I don't know. I, I feel, I don't think it's innately bad to want to live longer. Mm. And more importantly, like, I think there needs to be a, a, a distinction between like, lifespan and health span right like yeah. i'm all about i don't like i want to live till i'm pretty old but more importantly i want to live well until i'm pretty old so you know i want to be feeling like i'm 40 when i'm 60 um i want to continue to move i want to continue to like play with my grandkids and do what i want to do up and in, up into old age and i don't think there's anything wrong with that i think yeah. you know that humans like, really can do that if and a lot of it doesn't have to do with becoming like by like any form of bioengineering even though we're already doing things like lasik eye surgery right like that's mm -hmm. literally uh yeah. like the directly like having lasers shot into your eyeballs to see better um <laughs> but but yeah like 
I don't know, man. I think about it quite a bit. I do think there's a line, but it's so blurry because like on one side, it's like, yeah, like you can live longer by exercising more, by eating better, by getting optimal sleep and by reducing stress levels. But also it's like, yeah, you can, um, like I, I feel I, like I was in the nootropic space for quite a bit. And, you know, there's all these substances, the compounds that people are taking to potentially live longer. And I'm like, oh, but that's bad for your health. But then I think about it. I'm like, well, if you're living longer because of it, like who cares if there's side effects when you're 120 years old? So, and like, that's just on a, like whether or not I think it's good for you physiologically, um, ethically speaking. I don't know. I don't think that there's anything wrong with wanting to live longer. Do I think it's a little bit like if that's all you focus on, is it a little weird? Yeah, maybe. Uh, <laughs> maybe, you know, you're kind of sacrificing the present for the future in that case. But I, I, it, there is a negative connotation that comes along with the desire for longevity. Um, I don't know if I, I like it, it. You know, it's a very conflicting space. Yeah, that I, I, you know, I, I think about a lot, but in terms of formulating a, an opinion, like there's nothing like I just don't see it as being binary. Like I, I see there being, um, yeah, I mean, I, it's not a bad well, field to explore. So cause I think about too, and your point, the health versus time is a, the balance at which like we have to consider, right, is if you're 140 years old, but you can't move and you don't say anything and you just sort of sit there as a vegetable it's like okay what are we really doing here but somewhere between that and being a 20 year old adult in the prime of their thought and exploration and body coming to fullness and all this sort of things there's a proper moment of shift my brain always goes to 100 it's like that's the that's the time to die <laughs> yeah <laughs> I mean, it makes sense, right? the thing, but also I kind of think about it where there's multiple questions in hand here. One of which is your own self and your living. And like, if you're a hundred years old and you're this huge burden on everyone else's life, is that a problem? But also what if you have this sort of, maybe it's financial value at which you've been considered in society as in you've got a large bank account and you can then pay people to provide services for you that you need. And that's creating its own, economy into an older age is it still a bad thing and then you come to the larger larger picture which is the overpopulation question around okay great we as humans can keep going and figuring out ways to play our own bodies into a longer life or quote healthier life um but is that massive domination of society not just society the, the world ecosystem both nature animal and human combined inevitably there becomes a point where maybe it's not in the next 100 years or 300 years but over the next few thousands of years if this path continues with humans there becomes a point at which we're so domineering over any other competitive force whatsoever in life that like do we just automatically destroy it or do we consider ourselves a sacrifice towards the greater good? And then what are the ethics there? Like, for example, if we created a technology that we could find surgeries and resources and whatever it is to start living to 150, and this starts to happen over the next thousands of years, the population will explode. We'll have people who are 120 walking around, these kids going, and then it exponentially happens because now more people are having more kids at more times at more, and it just grows, grows. At what point, and this comes into the extraterrestrial conversation too, it's like, is there a weird inevitable need to discover new planet or is that just a made up bullshit and we have to eventually find the point of slow down on our own race or is it the way that we just engage with the balance of our own ecosystem? But again, inevitably, it's going to have to come down to human population. If you just cut out 6 billion of the people right now, like, all right, there goes the climate change issue. Like, it's really a population problem when we break it down. Yes, it's a corporate issue. Yes, it's a political issue, all this shit. But when you kind of start to scale it over the next thousands of years, it comes down to population growth equals we're destroying our ecosystem equals we will then hence be destroyed. Um, 
So I don't really have a question with all this. I guess I'm just talking out loud. I'm not. Yeah. Is it no, I'm ethical? Following. Is it an ethical issue in thousands of years to like? Do you think there should be a time stamp on human life? And do you think that number is a hundred? Or do you think it's something over? Or do you think it changes, assuming we had more access to resources? Or do we just sort of let people die on their own and it probably end up being the more quote lower class of society at which now there's these rich people who are growing into the 180s 300 years old them are i mean you there's always that cliche of you know asking 80 year olds how much money they'd spend to be 20 and broke again and they'd say all of it um so I, i think the more the money that floods into this industry the more commoditized these procedures, these medicines, supplements, you know, all of these features that go into increasing lifespan, the more commoditized they're going to become. And then the more readily available they're going to be to the wider population. In terms of overpopulation, you know, that is a huge discussion to have in itself. I have heard both sides of the overpopulation argument. Um, I have not dug into either of them deep enough to have a standpoint on where I stand on it. I used to think the world was definitely overcrowded. Still think the world's probably overcrowded, but I don't know. It's it's a very difficult, uh, complex question. But you know, the one thing that I do know is there tends to be a pretty linear correlation between education and income levels and the number of kids that families have. So yeah. you know, I see uh, as the world, you know, as people end up living longer. And as, you know, hopefully the rest of the world continues to become more educated because education is becoming more pervasive, thanks in part due to technology, almost exclusively due to technology. Um, You know, more people have cell phones and they're running water. Um, That hopefully would offset the, um, the growing lifespan of the population. And on top of that, you know, this is something we see already as people are already living longer the age of retirement continues to be pushed back. So if you're operating like you're a 40 year old when you're 80, you know, you'll probably end up being working still because you still have another 20 years to, to look for it, uh, to look forward to and to save up for. So I think that, you know, given the fact that this is going to happen over a period of not, I mean, yeah, I mean, over a generation, um, I don't know if it's, I'm sure there's going to be a transition period in terms of do we need another planet to sustain this next level in human evolution? I don't know. Um, it definitely wouldn't hurt to have one, but yeah, I, space is not my, not my specialty. Yeah. And my thought too, with, I mean, I appreciate all those thoughts on that stuff, but on specifically that space idea, um, this is where I just kind of get a little pissed off sometimes is I get the forward thought of, Oh no, the greater humanity expanding into space. Yeah, like there is still so many relevant issues to solve here on Earth right now. People talk about like, oh, we're gonna have to move to Mars. It's like, okay, if you actually know anything about with within the astronomy and all this stuff, like the cancerous like sun rays, like the way we'd have to essentially nuke Mars to even get the basic access to a tiny bit of water and create these little farms. I get the longevity, what if we were in space? Oh, so glorious. Like, wait a second. We have so many fucking issues right now on earth to solve that could clearly be solved with financial and a little bit of social backing. Um, So that's just to make that kind of thought clear is over the next 10,000 years as a human race in survival, I get the space thing. But over the next fucking 50, like, can we just solve Earth first for a little bit? Like, there's so much yeah. we have access to solve. And it's just simply a distribution issue. It's like when you're saying, like, the clean water and health stuff. It's, like, technology has advanced that. There, there's a way to get clean water to every human on Earth. Yet, there are tens of thousands of millions of people dying every single day. Little kids who are just, like, so I don't know. There's also the the shift to and realizing like the balance of these things like earth is so savable and not even just savable inevitably forever forward going to be this domineering force so it has its ecosystem in place 
in when we talk about climate change, everyone's like, oh no, like save the planet. It kind of pisses me off because I'm like, listen, the planet's gonna be fine. The planet does what it does. It's about the way we're affecting the planet that's gonna get us killed. And so when we're talking mm-hmm. about climate change, save the planet, what we're actually saying is save ourselves and save the systems in place that keep a lively world existing because if we start to kill that off, it's just the planet's gonna run its course. It'll be fine. Like, quote Mother Earth, like she's chilling. It's about it's about us. But I think about yeah. that when it comes to the whole space convo is cool, invest a little bit on now, but there's such a 50 year, 100 year purity, 100 year period right now that, in my opinion, is so much wiser to attend to, not only for the sake of basic human rights and standards of living, but even for the people who are trying to get into space for financial reasons and glory, it's like, fucking, you can be financially supported and make money by helping people in the world like if you're genuinely solving problems which there are plenty of problems in the world right now like that's the way to go for at least the next 100 years until we get the basic standard of living solved and then we can talk about space over the next 10,000 um but yeah i don't know i guess that's just my overall yeah. thing. No, No, I think you're totally right. There are so many problems that are so much more pressing than exploring space. Like maybe I'm just a plebeian and I don't understand or care that much about astronomy in space. But yeah, I I I get that as well. Like it's kind of it's like yeah, like why are you already exploring those frontiers when there's so many problems to be solved here? Like Um, the frontier of a simple drink of clean water for every human. Like that's a fucking frontier to explore. Like, yeah. It, it also comes like a cultural frontier. glorification of it. Like the mystery of space versus the mystery of what it would be for everyone to be educated at a basic level. Like one sounds exciting. One sounds like something that should already exist. yet clearly doesn't. It's, I don't know. It's gonna yeah. Even like, can we just, like put aside a couple hundred million dollars to find like a biodegradable non uh endocrine disrupting alternative to plastic like yeah. plastic <laughs> i'm down here in mexico and everything's covered in plastic like hot meals are covered in plastic and that plastic seeps out into your food mm-hmm. and it just directly disrupts your endocrine system like that's one of the biggest contributors contributors to the male infertility crisis that's going on is like all these xenoestrogens from plastics and pollutions like can we not just contribute a couple hundred million dollars to that? I'm sure that would make some pretty significant headway. Or like, there, uh, yeah, there's so many small things, um, but <laughs> it's kind of frustrating, yeah. yeah. I don't know. I think it's a cultural shift too and just the way that people talk about it and actually value it more because the second you create the cultural value, that's where then the financial value comes and the financial value comes and the political value comes and when the political plus financial plus social comes and the solutions come. So 